We are still looking at logic. We're going to be looking at the concept of a predicate, and we're going to be looking at some quantifiers in this section. So let's get started. A predicate, it's an open sentence, is a sentence about one or more variables which becomes a statement when we give the variable a specific value. So we often write just a capital of P and whatever the variable is I will use in the brackets for my predicate. So let's take a look at this first one. P of x, x squared is greater than 3x. Now, that can only be a statement if I know something about x. So this is a predicate. It's a sentence about x. Now, as soon as I tell you what x is, this will become a statement, which can be tested if it's true or false. Or the predicate about xy, x squared plus y squared is 25. It can only be true or false. It can only be a statement if I've got values for x. And same with the next two. So these are all predicates. They're open sentences. We cannot test them to be true or false unless I have a specific value for n or a set of values or I know where the variables come from. All right. Now, sometimes I've got a predicate that's already a statement before I got values. For example, for some number n, we don't know what number it is, but if I square it, I get a positive or zero. That's always true for numbers. All right, so that's always true. Or if I've got a predicate about x, that says sine of x is greater than 2. We know sine of x is between 1 and minus 1. So that is always false. So for those special cases, I did not need to tell you what my variable is because it's always true or false. But in general, we need to say something about that variable to treat the predicate as a statement. All right. Now, we just need to refresh our number systems before we look at all the predicates and the quantifiers that we're going to look at now. Natural numbers, integers, rational numbers, and real numbers. You can pause and just refresh them. Make sure you know what these numbers are before we go on, but I require you to know that. All right, so let's take a look. Now I'm assigning a value for x. I'm saying x squared is greater than 3x for all natural numbers. Now, the natural numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now it becomes a statement. It doesn't mean that it's true, but it's a statement. So we can test if it's true or false. I can say let x be equal to 1. 1 squared is equal to 1. 3 times 1 is equal to 3. 1 squared isn't greater than 3. Or alternatively, I can say 1 squared is less than or equal to or less than 3 can be stricter and say it's less than. So it's definitely not greater than. So this statement is false. All right. Next one. Statement about n, but n has only one specific value. It's a bit of a boring statement, but let's take a look at it. n squared is less than or equal to n. n is equal to a half. Well, n squared is then equal to a quarter. And I know that a quarter is less than or equal to a half. So this statement is true. All right. So we're going to test more predicates, but for that we need what we call quantifiers. Two symbols that we need. We love using symbols in mathematics. Here's two more symbols. This upside down capital A is for all or for each or for every. It's called the universal quantifier. The backwards capital E means there exists or there is or for some. Those are the words we use. It's the existential quantifier. So we're going to be using those quantifiers together with predicates that are statements to test if they're true or false. So let's get started. Here's a whole lot. Consider the following sentences. Are they true or false? Well, firstly, the sentence becomes a statement because there's enough information. So these are statements. Let's check if they're true or false. All right. For all integers x, that means for all. So I'm saying for all integers x, x is greater than zero. So what am I saying? I'm saying every single integer is greater than zero. Now, now you need to watch out with how you tell, explain to me whether it's true or false. If I say to you, I've got an integer 10, 10 is greater than zero, so it has to be true. That is not a good argument because I'm talking about all the integers. So I need to check all the integers. I can't just find one and say, oh, I'm happy with one. It means for all, so all of them. So let's look at an integer. Let's first look at the statement. If I think of the set of integers, are they all positive? No. Let x be equal to minus 2. 
You can choose any of the negative ones or zero. Minus 2 is an integer. That's good enough. But also I've got minus 2 is less than zero. So this statement is false. I found one that doesn't match it. All right. Let's look at the next one. All natural numbers, if I square it, I get greater than or equal to that original number. Now let's take a look. The natural numbers, it's a set of 1, 2, 3, and on. Let's look at the first one, 1. If I square 1, that's greater than or equal to 1. Yes, it works for 1. If I square 2, I get 4, that's greater than or equal to 2. It works. If I square 3, I get 9, that's greater than or equal to 3. It's going to work for all of them. Now, I can just ask you, is the statement true or false? And you can tell me intuitively, I can see that it's true. But to prove it is a little bit more complicated. We need mathematical induction to prove that. And we mathematical induction is a different section. You can look at that. But assuming you have not done mathematical induction, this one we cannot prove to be true, but we can intuitively see that it's true. The first one, we could prove it to be false. All right, next one. There exists a natural number that's greater than zero. Well, if I look back at the natural numbers, they're all greater than zero. But that's not my statement. My statement says there exists one. Does there exist one? Yes. Let x be equal to 5. 5 is a natural number. And 5 is greater than zero. So that's true. I just needed one. I know I've got many. But my statement just needs one because I say there exists means I only need one. Next one. There exists an integer that if I square it, I get the number back. Now you need to go through your list of integers and see, is there an integer that if I square it, I get the same number back? There's actually two. Let x be equal to one. One is an integer and 1 squared is equal to 1. So this is true. There's another one. If x is equal to 0, 0 I know is an integer, and 0 squared is equal to 0. Those are the only two that work. But I only need one because my statement says there exists. All right, next one. There exists an integer that's greater than 0. Yes, I know. That's also true. We've seen lots of them. And we can use the same argument as up there. Let x be equal to, let's use a different number, 3. 3 is an integer, and 3 is greater than 0. So I found an integer, one integer that's greater than 0. That's all I need. I know there's lots of them, but I just need one. All right, next one. For all real numbers, if I square it, I get a number that's greater than my original number. Now you've got to go think of all your real numbers. Now we know if I square a negative I'm going to get something positive. So if I square a negative number, I'm going to get something bigger. So it works for the negative numbers. Does it work for zero? If I square zero, it's greater than zero. No, it doesn't work for zero. So I've got a contradiction here. I've got one counterexample to show me that it's false. Let x be equal to zero. Well, first let's just... Note, we checked, 0 is a real number, and 0 squared is equal to 0. 0 isn't greater than 0. That's not true, so this is false. All right, so you can find some others. You can look at x equal to a half or some decimal. If I choose a number bigger than 1, for 1 it doesn't work. So to prove a for all statement false, what you need is at least one counterexample. There could be many, but you need one. Same here for the for all statement in the first example here. To prove it false, I need one counterexample. To prove if there exists statement true, I also need one example. But to prove a for all statement true, I need to check it for all of them. And same to prove if there exists statement false, I need to check it for all of them. All right, now let's look at these statements. They've got some X's and Y's in them. So let's just make sure. For all X in the real integers, there exists a Y such that if I add them, I get zero. So I, what am I saying? If I pick any integer, I can find some integer to add to it to give me zero. Now, this is the concept of an additive inverse. 
But because I'm saying for all x, I cannot just use the one example. I know 5 plus minus 5 gives me 0. But this is not enough to prove this statement true. It's not enough. I need some more work. I need to show it for every single integer. Now, I can't go down the list. There's an infinite number of them. So what do I do? I say, all right, let's start with some integer x. Let x be an integer. How am I going to find that y? We know it's an additive inverse I'm looking for. So I'm saying let y be equal to minus x. If y is equal to minus x, my properties of numbers tells me, then y is also an integer. And what happens if I've got x plus y? I get x plus minus x, and I get 0. So I've proved a for all statement true by using a general case. You cannot use a specific example to prove this one true. All right, next one. For all integers x, I can find a y such that x divided by y gives me minus 1. So let's just look at examples. If I say 5, can I find something 5 divided by what gives me minus 1? Oh, that's minus 5. Okay, that's minus 1. If I've got a negative number, minus 3, do I have something I can divide it with to give me minus 1? Yes, 3. Now what about 0? Always look at 0, because 0 could cause trouble. Is there something I can divide 0 with? To give me minus 1? No, I can't find anything. So this is going to be, the previous one was true, this one's going to be false. Because I'm saying for all x's, to prove this statement false, I need one counterexample. I'm going to say let x be equal to 0. And then simply, I cannot find a y in the integers such that x divided by y is equal to minus 1. Because 0 divided by y is going to be 0 for every non-zero integer. And if I choose 0 as y, then I've got something that's undefined. So I found one counterexample, so that's enough to prove this for all statement false. The next one, for all x's, for all y's, in the integers, if I add them, I get an integer again. Now, this is actually a property of integers. Integers are closed under addition, and this is what this says. For every two integers, if I add them, I get an integer again. And this statement is true.